Hello everyone, I'm Professor Geek. Welcome back to my channel. I guess we have to talk about this. We have to talk about the Batman wedding. The issue isn't even out yet. Batman number 50, but they have revealed spoilers for everything that's going to happen, and that's in the New York Times. It's not just some rumor mill on a website. This is actually the basic story of the issue. I suspect they realized there was going to be a lot of outrage, and they wanted to somehow... I don't know, get ahead of it somehow. I don't really know how that would work. But this is a real problem from Tom King on Batman. I've made a series of videos over the last year on Tom King's Batman run, and I consistently kept saying he seems like a great guy, and he has some wonderful ideas. The execution isn't that great thus far. I really wish he'd step up the game there. But, you know, I'm going to stay in the game. Let's see what happens, because he does seem like a great guy, and he does have these wonderful ideas. Time and again, I mean, how many times can you just keep delivering a dud, Tom King. And the problem here is not that Batman and Catwoman aren't going to be married. Because that is the big spoiler of the Batman issue, is that they end up not being married. I didn't even bother with all the details. It was ridiculous. I'm not one of those people who are deathly invested on them being married or deathly against them being married. I, I really don't care as long as the story's done well. And this has not been a story that's executed in any type of integral, well-crafted manner. This is shock value. This is the lowest level of soap opera. This is something to be ashamed of. Not just the story, but the marketing, too. In DC Nation number one, and I'm sure he said things like this elsewhere, but this is the last place I remember reading it, Tom King talked about talking with Scott Snyder and plotting out his direction for Batman. Of course, Scott Snyder had been writing Batman before Rebirth, and Tom King had a long discussion with him, and they were talking about what direction he might take Batman in in his run. And they said, we need to figure out something that's never been done with Batman before, but is still true to his character. And the insinuation there is that a marriage to Catwoman would fit both of those bills. Now in this issue, Tom King is going to try to tell us through Catwoman and through the circumstances that, nope, a marriage isn't true to Batman's character. So, gotcha. That's not good storytelling. That's why M. Night Shyamalan's movies started to fail one after the other, because they were all just one great big lead-up to a gotcha moment. That's not a story. There's no reason to be involved. I don't trust you anymore as a storyteller, Tom King. I don't trust you. Why should I invest my time now into any story that you develop and lay out and draw out the characters and raise the stakes and try to engage me with when I know that you're the type of writer who will just pull the rug out from under me at the last moment just for a little shock value? That's what this is. It's the cheapest level of writing. It's something that should be workshopped out of a script in the very first workshop session of a writing program. This is awful. Now, I don't place all of the blame on Tom King's shoulders for this because this is a theme we're seeing now in DC Comics. And it's only been coming into focus recently, but we see it with Bendis and how he has marketed his Superman series, the Man of Steel series, and how he's been talking about the things he's going to do, and he's teased, and he's messed with fans. He's even come out and admitted that he's been messing with fans. Fans don't want to be messed with. That's not marketing. You're not the writer of a soap opera that tease and tantalize us and tune us into the next Penny Dreadful. These should be mythological tales. These writers aren't seeing them as deep mythological tales or folklore of the American culture because their editor doesn't see them that way. And that's where I really want to lay the blame here. Mr. Dan Didio. Dan Didio had been involved with DC Comics for a while, but he didn't really have all the power. He wasn't really promoted to the head guy until shortly before the New 52. And then once he was, once he had that position, once Jim Lee had his position next to him, this was the young guard coming up front. These were the young guys who grew up on Marvel, and they had to subjugate all of their ideas and whatnot to the stalwarts of DC who had been there guarding these iconic characters for so long, the Paul Levitts and so forth. Now they were in charge. They could do what they wanted to do with these characters. And what did they want to do? They wanted to make them all darker, all grittier, all more like Batman, and even make Batman even darker and grittier than he was supposed to be. Hence the New 52. Spectacle sales poured in. It was a momentous moment because for the first time ever, they were restarting the numbering of Action Comics and Detective Comics, a universe-wide reboot, unprecedented even for DC, that's known for its crises and reboots and such, resetting everything back to the beginning. 
it was a horrible story, even as it was a horrible idea. The DC universe and all of its richness and all of its resonance in the American culture is not all filtered through Batman. Pardon my French, but it's the most dumbass idea anybody could have ever had. Aside from that, it was just bad storytelling. As a universe, the timelines did not make sense. How could these characters have done all this and still be this old? And no one said anything about it. They just kind of pretended, eh, whatever, it's comic books, it's a soap opera, just watch it. Well, all those spectacle sales and all those new fans that came on board did not last. People can argue the fact that they personally like the new 52 and whatever, as long as they want. But the fact is, the numbers show that not enough people agreed. Comic book sales were tanking. We heard news from the higher-ups and Warner Brothers telling DC to stop Batgirling all of their characters because they'd taken Batgirl and all these radical things where they're in. The SJWs started to squeal and giggle because it matched their agenda. So they started to try to do that with all of the characters, and the sales started tanking. No one was interested in that nonsense with Superman being a, a rocky wannabe with a crew cut and Jim Gordon being in a robo Batman suit. It was just stupid. It was really bad storytelling. So the corporate had to come down and say, stop that. Then shortly thereafter, in what we know was a move dictated from the higher-ups as well, we had Rebirth. Rebirth was publicized as a return to the brightness and to everything that made the DC Universe great. What a lot of people don't realize, though, is that Dan Didio was made to shut up and take a back seat during this time. His ideas had failed, and they placed Jeff Johns creatively, not, not position-wise or anything, Dan Didio was still in charge, but they placed Jeff Johns' ideas and Jeff Johns' creative vision up front. And that gave us rebirth. It brought back tons of fans who had abandoned the universe. It gave us hope again for our characters. It brought us back our Superman. It fixed so many awful things in the DC universe, and it promised to be a two-year story arc that would be worked out in the Superman Doomsday Clock that Jeff Johns would also write. And it started out strong. It started out wonderful. There were some things, of course, that many of us would have liked to see and change back a little faster, but we were okay knowing that this was on a clear path. We were working our way towards something, and this was good. After Rebirth, though, as soon as they took the Rebirth title off the comic books, there was nothing resolved. There was no coherent end to the Rebirth story arc. Doomsday Clock kept getting pushed back. They kept forcing in this whole Dark Knight's Metal thing because Batman, Batman, Batman... And if you look at the press, and if you look at the marketing, and whose names start to rise to the top slowly but surely, it's Dan Didio again. Until we finally have the announcement that Jeff Johns is stepping away from his position and is only going to be involved in writing some comics here and there and so forth. And that Dan Didio is firmly back in the press again. He's the one saying, this is what we've got coming up, and this, and this, and this. And he's back to all of his old tricks. Dan Didio, and these are words from his mouth, I'm not even making up things about him. He does not believe that superheroes should have happy family lives. He hated that original Superman Lois Lane marriage, which was one of the reasons why he got nixed in the DC New 52. He hated legacy characters. That's why Dick Grayson stopped being Nightwing and he became some weird, stupid special agent for Spiral. It was a ridiculous idea. And then suddenly Barbara Gordon gets her legs back in the New 52. People are still angry about I'm still angry about that. She's a broken character. She's just a virtue signaler in comic books right now. Her stories are all subjugated to agendas. And it's such a shame because as Oracle, she was an inspiration to so many people. She was an incredibly strong, hopeful, and powerful character. And you had so many other people taking up the Batgirl mantle, becoming their own incredibly powerful characters. Most notably, Cassandra Cain. Her story arc was incredible. And if you take Batgirl out of her story arc, that whole time period, nothing really fits. She's still in the Rebirth comics right now as Orphan, and it's great to have her, but it just doesn't, it doesn't fit. There's something missing. And this is all Dan Didio's fault. He doesn't like legacy characters for whatever reason. Wally West, Wally West had to be gone. Didn't even explain anything. Wally West is just gone. Doesn't exist anymore. Let's just have Barry back. He's just our Flash. And if you look at all of these stupid ideas and beliefs that Dan Didio has about comics. They don't sell the comics. They do not. Maybe in a flash in the pan spectacle sale, but then that charge is spent and you don't have anything else to go for and the sales fall. And since they've already made those spectacle sales with the new 52, 
no one cares about changing things up again. People liked the way Superman, for example, was going. They loved Super Sons by Tomasi. They loved Superman by Tomasi and Gleason and Action Comics by Dan Jurgens. All of those creators had continued stories that they wanted to tell in that line. Dan Didio doesn't believe in sticking with what works. He believes things constantly have to be shaken up, can't let people get too happy, can't let the characters be too happy. So we had to shake that all up, move all those writers out. They were doing amazing work, but let's just spit on them, move them out, bring in Bendis, because he somehow deserves it. Let him mess with the fans, turn it into a great big soap opera, mess around with Superman, Lois, and John, and Super Sons. I don't even know if we're getting it back now. I know the miniseries is coming which I think is going to take place back in time or something. It, there's not enough face palms in the world for the level of bad storytelling that Dan Didio continues to preside over. I don't know why this man still has a job. I pay far more than I responsibly should for comics each week. And I am scaling back. And I'm not the only one. A lot of people feel the same way. And even if they weren't ready to make the call as I am right now, they were very close, and I can guarantee that Batman number 50 is going to knock them over that edge too, especially coming out the same week as Man of Steel 6. Can't really speak to Man of Steel 6 yet because I don't know how it's going to tie up, but as we've said in the issue-to-issue -issue reviews, even if somehow somebody somewhere waved a magic wand and made everything work out in the end, I still don't appreciate being taken on this journey, being toyed with like this. That's not storytelling. That's not mythology. There's no catharsis in that. There's no inspiration in that. It's just messing with somebody to get their money for the next issue. Just stringing them along to the next cliffhanger. This is the basis type of storytelling there is. And Dan Didio and the writers that are working for him right now should feel truly ashamed of themselves as artists. So I could go on about it, but I'll stop. Let me know what you think about these changes. Again, I know that some people were strongly for or against the marriage, and that's not really something I'm willing to argue about because I didn't feel strongly for or against it. I thought it could have worked if done well, but the point is this whole story was not done well. You can't string people along and build up this whole big thing just for a gotcha moment in the end. The fan man, Chris Moe and I are planning on hopefully, if schedules can work out, to do a live stream, perhaps Friday, and this will be after the Batman marriage issue and the Man of Steel 6 has released, so we will be able to talk details and to actually talk about specific moments in the story and so forth. And I know he feels much the same way I do about Dan Didio, so we can continue to talk about the direction that DC Universe is taking in general. Hopefully that will come together. I'm also going to see Ant-Man and Wasp on Thursday, so I will be coming to you with a review for that very soon. Until then, make sure you click like and definitely subscribe. We're growing nicely, which is great to see. The more I grow the channel, the faster I can complete this book and have this out in your hands. It will take a lot of upfront funding for illustrations and perks and so forth to go on the campaign. But I deeply appreciate your support, your comments, and your video shares. And until next time, keep enjoying and digging deeper into the hero stories you love. Thanks for watching.